Hi guys, in this video we are going to talk about conditional logistic regression and explore the difference between conditional and ordinary, or aka unconditional logistic regression. And I'll also briefly touch on G and GLMM, so stick around. So let's recap what logistic regression is. It is used when we want to model an outcome variable Y by either a Bernoulli or a binomial distribution. So when y is binary, 0, 1, or when y is an integer between 0 and m, which can be also mi, it can be different between different uh, observations. In R, we usually supply the empirical ratio, so the proportion of successes per observation. The GLM formulation relates the probability to the predictors through the logit link function. So the logit of p is equal to log of p divided by 1 minus p, and we relate this to a linear predictor, meaning it's really equal to x transpose beta, where x here is a vector where we add a 1 to account for the intercept. The inverse link function, the sigmoid, ensures that the predicted probabilities fall within a valid range of between 0 and 1, and is one of the main reasons why we are using this model. In essence, what this model captures is that for certain x values, the probability of observing a 1 is higher than for other x values. And this relationship can be visualized by the blue curve over here, where on the left we have lower probabilities. Yeah, on the left we have low x's with lower probabilities of getting a 1, and as x increases to the right, we have higher probabilities of getting a, a 1 on the y. Now, conditional logistic regression was originally developed for the case of matched case control studies, as introduced by this paper by Breslow and Associates in 1978. In a matched case control, we have M controls matched to L cases. The matching is typically based on some general factors such as age, sex, race, and etc. The aim is to assess the effects of other predictors, such as smoking, meat consumption, and so forth, on the probability of getting an event or of getting a y equal to 1. In this table, you can see an example of such data with m and l equal to 1, also known as 1 to 1 matching. And it's also possible to have different m's and l's pair groups. In this type of model, we condition on the total number of events or cases in each group, treating it as known. As a result, in the course of the analysis, the intercept terms will disappear from the model and we won't be able to estimate them. Without the alpha intercepts, we can't compute total probability or absolute probability, but we can still compute the odds ratio. So we can still compute what is the relative uh, probability of getting a 1 comparing two different individual, which individual has a higher probability of getting a one and which has a lower probability. And we'll explore this more thoroughly later in this video. So what is the problem? Why isn't regular logistic regression enough for the matched case uh, control scenario? Well, coefficient estimates are only reliable when there are enough observations relative to the number of parameters. And this is especially true for categorical variables. For example, if xj, the jf predictor, is binary, we usually require that we have at least a minimal amount of observation uh, when x is equal to 1 and when x is equal to 0. And as a rule of thumb, you can think of between 10 to 50 um, overall cases where x1 is equal to 0 and x1 is equal to 1, uh, but we can use it to estimate the true coefficient of x. But it's also true for other variables of interest. So for example, in a scenario where we have only 100 observations, but 51 parameters, an intercept, an X uh, parameter, and 50 groups that are coded, say, as 49 dummy variables, here the beta of X will also be seriously biased. And it can be shown that asymptotically, the estimator will be doubled its true value for one-to-one -one matching. So in a matched case control studies, we just don't have enough observations relative to the number of groups. Moreover, getting more data means creating more groups, which only worsens the problem. Here is a table from Breslow and Day's book, Statistical Methods in Cancer Research, Volume 1. You can see that for any true odds ratio given on the left and any probabilities shown on top, 
the one-to-one -one matching effectively squares the odds ratio, meaning that the estimated beta coefficients are doubled. Note that these are asymptotic results. The actual values can differ substantially. So let's derive the likelihood in the matched case control scenario. For simplicity, assume we have only two observations per group. The likelihood is the probability of observing our data given some specific model parameters, the betas. In other words, we are asking what is the probability of getting the observed cases and controls given the individual x values and given that the sum of each pair must be exactly equal to 1 because this is how the study was designed. Since each pair is independent of the others, we can factor the overall likelihood into the product of the strata level likelihoods, that is the likelihood for each group separately. Now it's worth noting that in the Breslow and Associates paper, they use the notation of px given y, that is the probability of x given y. Now personally, I don't think it makes any sense. I don't agree with such notation. And also I think what they really meant is what nowadays is usually denoted by p of y given x. Um, in any case, they immediately use Bayes formula on these terms and they immediately switch to P of Y given X. I, I'm going to use P of Y given X uh, from the start, which is more natural and I think more correct. Finally, note the contrast between the conditional logistic regression and the regular logistic regression. In the regular logistic regression, we ignore the matching and treat each observation as if it is drawn independently. Um, and so we can break the total likelihood into the product of the individual likelihood. Going from the strata level probability, we use conditional probability to get this expression. How did we get this? Well, the law of conditional probability is this, but in our case, A is a subset of B, so the numerator is just P of A and the denominator is P of B. Now, since both outcomes are binary and not negative, there are only two ways for the sum to be equal to one. Either the second one is one or the first one is one. We can now break the probabilities to the individual level since without the constraints of the sum being equal to one, the probabilities are independent and should be completely decided by our logistic model. We then substitute these probabilities with the model-based probabilities. These quantities cancel as they appear both in the numerator and in the denominator, and we end up with this. Note that here the intercepts cancel out and we are left with this. So the intercepts canceled out and we cannot actually estimate them from the likelihood. These are the strata level likelihoods, one for when the first observation is the case and one for when the second observation is the case. And we could have also pre-ordered the data that it's always that the first observation is the case and we are only left with the first one. We then take the log of the product of these terms to get the full conditional log likelihood and we find the betas that maximize these expression using some numerical optimization algorithms such as newton raphson And so we get the beta estimates, there is also ways to get the standard deviation and compute significance but I won't touch upon this on this video. Note that this analysis also generalizes to any M or L. One question you might be asking yourself is why should we even care about the groups? Can't we just ignore the grouping and run a regular logistic regression, a marginal model that doesn't account for the different groups? And maybe you're telling yourself, okay, we can account for the grouping, but maybe using some method like G or GLMM. And if you are not familiar with these methods, you can check out my videos on them. I will link them in the description below. In a nutshell, both approaches allow us to account for possible correlations within groups. G is a marginal model. It corrects for the within group correlation in the likelihood equations, but it estimates the global or population level betas. And GLMM is subject specific or strata specific, meaning that the beta coefficients represent the subject specific effects. And here you can see an example with a random intercept added to the model. You can see the difference clearly in this famous graph from Agresti's book. In a random intercept model, GLMM gives different curves for each stratum based on their intercepts, while G produces a single global slope across the population. So the answer to these questions is that sometimes we can do that, 
but not always. And in matched case control, it's often the case that we cannot do this and we have to use conditional logistic regression. Let me give you an example. Suppose our data comes from municipal elections and we want to investigate whether a candidate's income or wealth affects their chances of being elected. Cities in wealthier regions will generally have candidates with higher incomes than cities in poorer regions. But in both rich and poor regions, a single mayor is elected. Here you can see how the data might look in a table and a plot where each color represents a different city with two candidates. And I made the colors repeat after a while. So for example, only these two red points represent two candidates from the same city. These two red points already represent another city. Now, suppose that income is significant. That is that candidates with higher income have higher probability of being elected. In this case, a regular model treating cities as a fixed factor will produce a bias coefficient estimates as we saw before. Marginal model, meaning a regular logistic regression that ignores the groups, will fail to detect the income effect because among the elected candidates, they are both low and high income individuals, right? We see that the range of income is about the same for the elected and the non-elected. So a marginal model will also fail. Random effect model, GLMM, will fail because it's not that some cities have a higher overall chance of electing a mayor than other cities. Each city still elects only a single mayor. And the same is true for G model. So it's not that there's within group correlation and some cities have higher chances of getting uh, elected than other cities. No, each city still has a single outcome. So all these models will fail, but a conditional logistic regression will usually succeed. Now I want to stress an important reason why this happens. So the main reason GLMM and G models fail is that by the nature of the problem, there is no between group variation. So there is no between group effect on the Y's because the Y's are the same in each city. But at the same time, there is a substantial within group variation as candidates with higher income have a higher probability of winning within each city. Again, I'm assuming that this is true for the sake of illustration. I'm assuming that the data came uh, from some model where higher income did in fact cause a higher probability. Now, this city election example mirrors exactly the matched case control design because there too, the number of cases is predetermined. Typically, uh, in a one-to-one -one matching, there will always be one case per group. And there is also another important reason, and it is that the predictor of interest, income, is correlated with the group variable city. In other words, candidates in wealthier cities tend to have higher income. This correlation makes it even harder for marginal models to detect that there is an actual effect. If instead, income were widely distributed within cities, a marginal model might still be able to pick up the association. I want to stress this because these reasons, one, a fixed number of outcomes per group, and two, a strong correlation between the predictor and the group are not necessarily true for the general stratified data. Nonetheless, and although conditional logistic regression was not developed for general stratified data, it is often used in stratified designs when there are few observations per group. And let me give you an example of this. Suppose we are investigating some rare disease and there are two types of it, a regular and an aggressive type. We want to test if a certain X variable affects the probability of getting a more aggressive type. Now each hospital we contact might only have a few cases of the disease. So getting more data means approaching more hospitals or medical centers, and by this, again, increasing the number of groups and the number of parameters that we need to estimate. When we use conditional logistic regression in such setting, we are essentially assuming that the between group effect is weak or negligible or non-existent. We can see this reflected in the likelihood structure. In the stratified case, we know that the observation came from the same cave group, but we don't know their sum. We can include the group total as part of the observed event, 
since it is determined by the individual outcomes and adds no new information. But if we condition on it, we get the following. Conditional logistic regression focuses only on the left part and essentially captures the within group effect. It completely ignores the right part, which would account for the between group effect. This can lead to false conclusion. For example, if the data actually came from a simple marginal model as depicted here, and the groups are correlated with X, conditional logistic regression would fail to detect a significant effect. So the bottom line is, if the data truly comes from a match case control study or some other design that is similar to this, you should use conditional logistic regression. But if the data is merely stratified, in my humble opinion, you should exercise caution and consider checking multiple models. At the very least, be aware that you are implicitly assuming weak or non-existent between group effects. Before moving on to the code, I just want to briefly explain how I calculated the conditional probabilities per stratum. The model includes only a single predictor X with a one-to-one -one matching. The conditional probabilities are given as follows, with the intercept disappearing, as we saw earlier. Notice that we can denote the probability as P1 and 1 minus P1. If we divide both numerator and denominator by X of beta X, we arrive at the following expression, which is simply the sigmoid function of this. Finally, also note that the package used to run conditional logistic regression in R is the survival package. The reason is that the likelihood for conditional logistic regression model is equivalent to the likelihood of a stratified Cox model where the time to event is set to a constant. So rather than writing new code uh, for conditional logistic regression, the implementation simply feeds the problem into a Cox PH. So let's switch to the code. I'm running this code in Google Collab with R. You'll need to install the following packages to run GLMMs, G and conditional logistic regression. Here I'm creating the data set. We'll have 100 observation divided into 50 groups with a one-to-one -one matching. I initialize the Y values to be zeros. Here is the code for calculating the conditional probabilities. Next, I set the Y values according to the conditional probabilities within each stratum. You can see the first few observation of the data set here. The first model will fit is a regular logistic regression, treating the groups as fixed effects. You can see that when running a binomial GLM, the estimated beta coefficient is more than double the true effect. Note that we happen to get lucky here. The estimate is almost exactly twice the estimated conditional effect as we will see later but the variance is very high. And so running this with a different data or using a different seed would likely produce wildly different results. Next, we fit the marginal logistic regression, meaning we ignore the groups. As we can see, this model completely fails to detect any effect of income on election outcomes. Next, we fit the GLMM model with a random intercept. Here we get a warning about a singular fit, and we can see that the model failed to detect any random intercept effectively giving us the same output as the marginal model. After that, we move to the G model. Again, we receive warnings. The estimated correlation matrix is not positive definite, meaning it's not a valid correlation matrix. We also see a lot of NANs produced and the estimate is negative. And indeed, this is not a valid correlation matrix as you cannot have a correlation larger than one. Finally, we fit the conditional logistic regression. This time we obtain an estimate very close to the true beta of one, and it comes out highly significant, so hooray. My final point here is that you need to be cautious when the data is stratified rather than truly matched. In this example, I create 50 X values and I order them from zero to five, assigning five observation per strata. The Y values are generated from a Bernoulli distribution with the true logits following this model. Because I order the X values before assigning the groups, there is very little within group variation, but a strong between group effect. As a result, the conditional logistic regression model fails to detect the effect. So again, the bottom line is, if you have a true matched case control, you should use conditional logistic regression. If you only have a stratified design, exercise caution. Well, that's all for this video. I hope you enjoyed and see you in the next one.